Don, hello again. Uh, nice to see you. Uh, thank you for inviting me for our second weekly show. Last week, we talked about the media. And this week, we are going to talk about equity versus equality. And uh, I hope you had a nice, healthy, relaxing uh, holiday weekend with your family. I did, Larry. I hope you did as well. I know I had a good equal equal time with my family. Yeah, see what I did there? A little equal. You know, quality <laughs> yeah, equal. Got it. Got it. Got it. <laughs> um, no, I had a great weekend. Thanks for asking. I hope you had one with had a great time with your family as well. I did. I did. Thanks. Good. Had a nice uh, holiday meal on Easter Sunday. Wonderful. Well, I, I want to take a minute and I, I want to preface our conversation so we can keep things nice and tight. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just jump right in here and say that I think that this whole conversation around equity is really a destructive policy created by the Democratic Party to just destroy America. I'm just going to say what I'm thinking. I'm, I, let's get it out of the way because I know we're going to have a, an interesting conversation about this. I don't think there's any question about that. And here's why. Allow me just a moment to lay my premise down. If we go all the way back to the Declaration of Independence in 1776, leading up to that for a number of years, we'd had a financial tyranny by the British monarch, by King George III and by the British Parliament. They were creating unequal rules. So you had one thing in England, you had another thing in the American colonies, in particular after the French and Indian Wars. And so what we have is a situation where it just became too much. The taxes were too much, the, the tension, the, the whole idea of, well, I thought I was a British citizen, but I'm not being treated like a British citizen is going on. And once they crossed a certain line, the Declaration of Independence was wrote, and it started with, we are all created equal and endowed by our creator with certain unalienable rights. And those are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. When the founders then would later write the U.S. Constitution in 1787, they would take from the, from the Declaration of Independence these principles that we would have a small government that's primary role was to ensure those principles of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Life is an obvious one. We all have the right to live our lives. Liberty means constraint on government. That's all the word means. So it means that the government can't run rampantly over its people without the consent of the people. And then third is happiness, that you have that right to pursue your life in a way that you deem necessary or the way that brings you the most fulfillment. And that means that you can use your time, your talents, your gifts, your God-given abilities to, to, to pursue those things if you choose to. Now, here's where I want to come back around to with equity in the Democratic Party. What equity does is it doesn't seek equal opportunity. If you go back to, let me pull this up here on my computer real quick. Joe Biden's executive order on January 20th, 2021. It was one of the very first ones he did the first day in office. It's titled an executive order on advancing racial equity and support for the underserved communities through the federal government. What this executive order seeks to do is realign the federal government so that it gives priorities to minorities over whites. This is the very thing that Martin Luther King Jr. was fighting against when he said, I have a dream. And he wanted the minorities to be equal with whites, not to be less than whites, not to be greater than whites. Why? Because as a God-fearing man, he understood that the goal is, is that we are equal as human beings and our worth and our value before God and before one another. But what you choose to do with your talents and your treasures and your abilities is up to you, not the government. Now, what I would presuppose, Larry, because I know you're going to agree with me in the big picture here, but where I want to come back to this is when I take a look at a guy like Bernie Sanders, who, you know, Bernie, in my view, is the leader of the socialist movement in America. You can strip the name Democratic Socialist out of it. Everything that comes out of his mouth screams government dependency, and the government's going to take care of you from the cradle to the grave. 
And it's going to make sure that you have what you need so that you can live. But you know what that does? That strips people of their dignity. It strips them of their ability to pursue the rights granted to them under the U.S. Constitution for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness because it injects fear. And that fear is, is that if I go do something that may or may not work, I have a guarantee right here from the government. And so I shouldn't tap all the potential that I have to be the best I can be. And that's my view on, on, on part of why I think the Democrats are destroying America. Now, here in a minute, we can get into some specific examples of that where they do it in law in the last year. But, you, you know, Larry, I kind of want to hear your perspective on this. I've talked for the last three or three and a half minutes. And, you know, what, what, do you, what are you thinking? What's on your mind? I think it's a great start. And uh, thanks for kicking us off uh, today. So how you phrase that the Democrats have a policy to dis that, that you think will end up destroying America, I would change to politicians destroying America. Because, Don, you have that good critical eye, and you can see it in the other party. And I keep saying, well, wait a minute, you know, the Democrats are in charge now. They have all, you know, two, they have both chambers of Congress, and they have the executive branch. So, it's easy to see how they're quote unquote destroying America and expanding government, but you have both parties that expanded the, you know, the, the, the government has grown to such a size. And when a conservative gets elected or like purportedly like Trump or even Bush, both of them or all every president or every administration continues to expand the reach of government generally. I actually somewhat am conservative and agree on smaller government, but there is a problem. So, and part of what I think Biden's problem is, is a messaging problem. And part of what you complain about with equity versus equality, because if you were to ask me, what would the liberal response be? When they say, when we say racial equity, I believe that not only just Democrats, but what everyone wants is just fairness. Um, there's an NFL rule that's designed to correct a past injustice that head coaches for uh, vacant head coaching positions, the rule is there has to be a, an interview with a minority candidate. Now, there's not a rule that says, look, you must interview a white candidate too, because it's all white coaches. So I use this example because when Biden says, okay, I want to um, give priority for minorities over whites. The problem, what he's trying to do is rectify a past injustice, just like the NFL is trying to do. They see a vast disparity of representation or, or the number of people in the population versus the representation in the economic community. So, um, and then, you know, now to take this to Bernie Sanders, Don, I never knew of Bernie Sanders until 2015 when he ran against uh, Hillary. And if you take Trump, Hillary, Bernie and every other candidate that ran back then, Bernie is one candidate who, when he just discussed a problem, he spoke for me. He spoke for many of my friends. A lot of other Democrats who supported both Hillary and Biden said, gee, when I look at Bernie, he says everything's spot on. The issue is, how do you correct that? Without regulation, what you have is you have consumer rights being violated by major corporations. So when Bernie discusses solutions, he is trying to keep in check the nature of power to put down the weak in favor of itself. Just like, you know, I know you hate the idea of socialism and trying to create equal outcomes. But without any type of effort, without any type of law, regulation, or propping up the weak, what you have is you have a, uh, 
ruling, ruling by the oligarchs and the elites, and you have a continuing disparity at the top, the top 10% of 1% versus the working class, which is exploited. So I think our discussion is to be, is a practical one where, you know, the, de the devil is in the details because every time you talk, I agree about 90 some percent, but I disagree that the problems with the Democrats, I agree, they have a messaging problem. Republicans always seem to be better messengers, but at the same time, I uh, applaud someone like Bernie for his expression of his, his ability to identify the problem. And maybe we both disagree and suggest maybe he wants to go too far, which is why it's good to have a discussion with you so we can maybe get to some solutions that better that we both agree with more so. So let me ask you a question or a couple of questions even. <clears throat> Bernie helped write the $1.9 trillion partisan Democrat go it alone American Rescue Act last year. And I disagree in that with the Rescue Act. I thought it was too much. I thought the Republicans no, 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 no. were in the better point there. Let no, me come out and say that right now, Don. Well, no, no, let's just stay with me for a second. Go ahead. All right. So in that bill that Bernie helped was one of the lead writers of in the Senate, because remember, he is the budget chairman. God help us all. But anyway, he's the budget chairman in the Senate. So here, here budget committee chairman, I should say. So here's what, here's what they did. They inserted in the rule of law in conjunction with the Biden administration enforcing it, that black farmers would get money over white farmers as a form of equity. Now, to me, that's a violation of the 1964 right, of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. And it was found to be one, too. And the, and, the, and the courts from the bottom all the way to the top said the same thing. You can't do that. All the way from the lowest district, U.S. federal district court, all the way up to the U.S. Supreme Court. And they didn't just do that once. They did it twice. They did it with business owners as well in distribution of, of those business funds. And the difference I have with your argument is, is that you use the NFL versus the government, or you compared the NFL with the government. The NFL is a private entity. And as a private entity, private entities can do things that the government cannot. That's established constitutional law. In the instance that we're talking about in regards to the government, if the government, which is the biggest heaviest, single-handed, most powerful entity in the United States, the U.S. federal government, it can cre create laws that are called capricious and arbitrary. I'm sure you've heard those words. Yep. Matter of fact, the mask mandate was just overturned on that very same thing yesterday using a part of a 1944 health act that they weren't allowed to use. And so the government can do things because there's no one there to stop the government, but who? The people. But when the people are uninformed and don't know exactly what the government's doing, it'll write, write a 20,000 page law that could have been written in 25, load it with all kinds of stuff, hand it over to the executive branch and say, there you go, interpret it however you want and do whatever you want. And the Supreme Court's been ruling against that as well, using the non-delegation doctrine under the separation of powers, going back to Congress and saying, say what you meant to say, say it clearly, and don't make this confusing. Right? And that's the problem. Government can do things that the private industries cannot. And that's what the founders were so deeply concerned about. Thomas reverse Jefferson that, was right? so wait, concerned about wait, this. Reverse that. The private industries can do what the government cannot. And that's true. But I there are law, but hold on, Larry. Who's going to hold the government in check when the government breaks the law? The there are no consequences to the government other than the court slapping it down saying right. you can't do that. That's right. But if a government breaks the law, if the government discriminate or if a business discriminates against someone, 
The go- that business can have its tail in sued off for it. If they break antitrust laws, people can go to jail. Look what happened to Enron. It, if, so what we're really talking about here is this, this shouldn't be a discussion about equity or equality. It should be a discussion about are the people serving in government doing so as servants of the people, enforcing the laws on the books fairly for everyone without prejudice. If they do that, and if they follow the timeless principles established in the, in the, in the Declaration of Independence, which are conferred over and over again in the Bill of Rights, we wouldn't be having these conversations. So again- And so government is the problem, not not, it's not the solution. It's the problem, as Ronald Reagan said. And we go back to these laws, the, there are these regulations that Biden created. Yeah, you're doing right. They are trying to topple this country down into pieces, little bit by little bit. Because if you erode all of those founding principles back, what do you have left? And I think you have a degree of what you're complaining about in every administration, Republican and Democrat. I, I think that Biden feels indebted to many um, African American leaders, and so the messaging is as it is 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 pro minority because I pre- probably feels he has political favors to answer to. And so when you pass an unconstitutional law, the su- people challenge it, and the Supreme Court strikes it down like they did. When you know in the Trump administration, you also had a um an administration that passed a tax law for the elite and the uh the super rich which rubbed the uh a lot of the democrats you're shaking your head i see you shaking your head that I, but don you see that in every administration you see uh corporate welfare laws that further created this gross imbalance that bernie ran uh, ran on that, that really helped put the Democrats back in power. So I, I don't think that, you know, the, 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 the Republicans will say that they're for small government, but really they're for big business that then really controls the government. The oh, come on, Larry. Who, who's big business support now? Who are the, the number one donors of the Democratic Party today? Well, this is, but we, we, we're still big saying business. The, it's we're, big business. Why? We're still because saying the, the Democrats same thing. keep rigging the rules for them. I don't disagree. That's why I'm trying to say. You no, started, it's not Republicans. Not, you started your argument by saying that it's the Democratic administration that's doing it. And I'm saying, no, it's government or it's it's the, the elites. It's people in power that are creating and quote unquote rigging a system. Look, I'm, so, I'm not I'm not blind to the to the problems in the Republican Party. You and I have had those conversations, and I have called them out numerous times. I'll continue to. I think, though, when you look at that 2017 tax law, what that law did, in conjunction with cutting regulations, was try to unleash the free enterprise of business. So that it could, and it's it really is Reagan's economic theory of supply side, which, by the way, would have worked flawlessly if Reagan had not negotiated with Democrats in the 80s on taxes. It would have worked flawlessly, but to get what he got, he he had to negotiate with a, with a Democratic-controlled Congress to get what he wanted. All right, so that's my argument on that. I'm sticking to it. Can't prove me right, can't prove me wrong, because it didn't no, happen either I, way. <laughs> I would say that's part of Obama's problem with the um, with the uh, Obamacare law, too. The, the, the concessions that he had to make that killed an otherwise very strong law. But he had to or, make those with Democrats, not Republicans, because they used reconciliation. For well, he still made it with the industry, with the health insurance, with with. with with maybe it's not Republicans, but it's still with the health insurance industry that that they were not able to completely fix the problem. They only lessened it yeah, to a right. degree. What 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 I'm right, saying? Let me just finish we can't have our point. cake and eat it too, Larry. We can't have it both ways. So, right? look, I'm not one, disputing you on that. The one what point I, that I want to make is you started by saying the quote unquote 
what the Democrats are doing is trying yep. to destroy America. Yep. And I think that you always can point about how an administration is doing things against the country in favor of the people in power. And so let me, not- let, let me explain why I come to that conclusion briefly. I can do this in, in one and a half minutes or less. And that 2017 tax law, what happened after that law passed? What happened to the economy? It, 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 we had prosperity. We had prosperity. We had, we had more jobs open than we had people to fill those jobs, even leading up to March of 2020 before the pandemic hit. We, this, the economy was on fire. It was one of the best economies in the last hundred years. I don't know if it was as good as Reagan's or not, you know, because I, I don't listen to Trump when he says, yeah, it's the best ever. You know, I don't know about all of that, but it was a fantastic economy after that happened. Now, you contrast that with government, with, with democratic policies. We spent the last year trying to ram through a three and a half trillion dollar partisan bill that would have trapped people in government dependency. They wouldn't have gotten jobs. They'd have stayed home because they got a guaranteed income from the government. They've got their money. They've got their food. They've got their shelter. They don't have to work nearly as hard. And what does that do to productivity in the United States? What does that do to what does that do to the wealth gap? It destroys the wealth gap when that happens. It makes it even worse because the people that are going to work their butts off to make it are going to achieve far beyond those that that say, I'm too afraid to take the guarantee that I have from the government. And it traps them in government dependency. And I want to come back around to the Declaration of Independence because it erodes their God-given talents and skills and abilities to use in the marketplace to make society a better place. And that's what Democrats have done is they're trapping people and government dependency and that trapping them keeps them from fulfilling their potential and contributing to society. I'm not gonna defend the Democrats and I'm gonna agree with you that you don't want to load up on government benefits to, to kill ambition because I see that with my own clients and, or I see that firsthand. So you don't have to make that argument with me. What I will say is in 2017, when you say that the economy and, and, and Republicans will say the economy was booming, you had people who are employed, working two to three jobs and weren't making ends meet. They weren't saving. They were living paycheck to paycheck. And then when COVID hit, they were thrilled to resign. You have the great resignation because they're being exploited by government. They don't even want jobs that are available. I, 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 don't, dis- I, don't, dis- I don't disagree with you on that front. But Fair here's enough. where but here's where I would say the answer to that is. The answer to that is, is that's that in life, we all have to start at the bottom. You as an attorney had to start at the bottom of the attorney world and work your way up to a certain attainment through through establishing yourself and proving your skills and abilities and etc the challenge for so many people in that situation is is that they take a low wage job and they get stuck in a low wage job for whatever reason i'm not going to pretend to know why there could be so many legitimate reasons for that there can be so many illegitimate reasons for that But the truth of the matter is that you get paid according to the skill and the worth that you bring to a company. Now, if the skill that you have is something that anybody can do, then what happens to the value of that skill in a supply and demand equation? It goes down. The value of that skill goes down. The pay level goes down. There is only one way to work yourself out of that. That's either through acquiring a skill, which many companies provide. Um, so it could be it could be company programs, training programs. It can be, and I, I've seen, I've seen. I've seen this happen, Larry, where a person worked retail and three or four or five years later, they've worked their way into management from a, from a nine hour, a $9 an hour job up to $45,000, $50,000 a year in three or four years. These companies don't necessarily want you to stay there forever because it doesn't benefit them when that happens. So there's a lot of societal factors that play into this. And what I would suggest to you is is that there are times the government even traps people into those situations. 
I, I think there's more than just the government trapping people because what you have is you have- Well, there's people trapping people. people. They trap themselves. Well, sure, but no, there's more. Look, you have some groups like Walmart, Target, who are now the major employers, not General Electric, General Motors. You have industries that now pay people beneath a living wage so you need the but government. That's not true anymore. They're paying $20, $25 an hour now. Target, well, hold on. Walmart, well, 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 I'm Costco. Still, I'm talking about 2018, 2017. You had people who were not earning living wages, and then they had to rely on government health insurance because they couldn't afford it. So they had to go on Medicaid. So what you had is you had the government paying, subsidizing, corporations who should have been paying people a living wage. And that's what made, you had a situation that made a candidate like Bernie Sanders more attractive than you may want him to be. But it was a, he spoke to a big problem and a big need. He's attractive because there are just so many people that are stuck in bad situations who bought into the lie that government can solve their problem. And it can't. All right, I think that's a good, that is a, a good ending point. You, you wrapped it up well. And I think then moving forward in, in future discussions, I think the devil's in the details. What solutions do we, would we each support that would be friendlier to a capitalistic society that uh, would solve people's answers rather than the government? Or exploring the question of, what is the role of government? Is it government's responsibility to solve all these problems for people? And if the government does it, yeah, who will? Because what do we have if a major corporation is left to its own devices? Do they put in health insurance on their own? Do they willingly pay a living wage? Will they, will a, um, a, uh, a company protect the consumer on its own, or will it just look for its own profits? It's a great conversation to have, and I'm looking forward to it. I am too. Don, thank you for the topic. Thank you for the uh, the weekly meeting. And uh, let's leave it there. Signing off. Tune in next week. Bye for now. See you later, everyone. Thanks for watching.